the walker in the old way. Most no to come, they say, said the fat lady with the string bag to the bus conductor. The bus conductor, who was West Indian, shook his head and gave a great glum sigh. Crazy weather, he said. One more winter like this, and I am going back to Port of Spain. Cheer up, love, said the fat lady. You can see no more like this. Sixty-six years I've lived in the Thames Valley, and I never saw it snow like this. Not before Christmas, never. Nineteen forty-seven, said the man sitting next to her, a thin man with a long pointed nose. That was a year for snow, my word it was. Drifts higher than your head, all down under Combe Lane, and Marsh Lane, and right across the common. You couldn't even cross the common for two weeks. They had to get snow ploughs. Oh, that was the year for snow. But not before Christmas, said the fat lady. No, it was January, said the man nodded mournfully. Not before Christmas, no. They might have gone on like this all the way to Maidenhead, and perhaps they did, but Will suddenly noticed that his bus stop was approaching in the featureless white world outside. <coughs> he jumped to his feet, clutching at bags and boxes. The conductor punched the bell for him. Christmas shopping, he observed. Uh-huh, three, four, five. Will squashed the packages against his chest and hung on to the rail of the lurching bus. I'll finish it all now, he said. About time. Wish I had, said the conductor. Christmas Eve tomorrow, too. Frozen blood, that's my problem. Need some warm weather to wake me up. The bus stopped, and he steadied Will as he stepped off. Merry Christmas, man, he said. They knew one another from Will's bus rides to and from school. Merry Christmas, Will said. On an impulse, he called after him. You'll have some warm weather on Christmas Day, the conductor grinned a broad white grin. You going to fix it, he called back. Perhaps I could, Will thought as he tramped along the main road, main road toward Huntercombe Lane. Perhaps I could. The snow was deep, even on the pavements. Few people had been out to tread it down in the, in the last few days. For Will, they had been peaceful days, in spite of the memory of what had gone before. He had spent a cheerful birthday with a family party so boisterous that he had fallen into bed asleep with scarcely a thought of the dark. After that, there had been a day of snowball fights and improvised toboggans with his brothers in the sloping field behind the house. Gray days with more snow hanging overhead, but inexplicably not falling yet. Silent days, hardly a car came down the lane, except the vans to the milk, of the milkman and the baker, and the rooks were quiet, only one or two of them drifting slowly to and fro somewhere over the wood. The animals, Will found, were no longer frightened of him. If anything, they seemed more affectionate before. Only rock, the eldest of the two collies, who liked to sit with his chin resting on Will's knee, would jerk away from him sometimes for no apparent reason, as if propelled by an electric shock. Then he would prowl the room restlessly for a few moments before coming back to gaze inquiring Will up, inquiringly up into Will's face and make himself comfortable again as before. Will did not know what to make of it. He knew that Merriman would know, but Merriman was out of reach. The crossed circle at his belt remained warm to the touch since he had arrived home two mornings before. He slipped his hand under his coat now as he walked to check it, and the circle was cold. But he thought that must simply be because he was outdoors where everything was cold. He had spent most of the afternoon shopping for Christmas presents in Slough, their nearest town, large town. It was an annual ritual, the day before Christmas Eve being the day when he was certain of having birthday present money from assorted aunts and uncles to spend. This, however, was the first year he had gone alone. He was enjoying it. You could think things out better on your own. The all-important present for Stephen, a book about the Thames, had been, bought a long, had been bought long before and posted off to Kingston, Jamaica, where his ship was on what was called the Caribbean Station. Will thought it sounded like a train. He decided he must ask his bus conductor friend what Kingston was like, though since the bus conductor came from Trinidad, perhaps he might have stern feelings about other islands. He felt again the small dro drooping of the, sp of the spirits that had come in the last two days, because this year, for the first time that he could remember, there had been no birthday present from Stephen, and he pushed the disappointment away for the hundredth time, and the argument that the post had gone wrong or the ship had suddenly sailed on some urgent mission among the Green Islands, Stephen always remembered. Stephen would have remembered this time if something had not got in the way. Stephen couldn't possibly forget. Ahead of him, the sun was going down, visible for the first time since his birthday morning. It blazed out fat gold and orange through, through a gap in the clouds. 
and all around the snow-silver world glittered with small gold flashes of light. After the gray, slushy streets of the town, everything was beautiful again. Will plodded along, passing garden walls, trees, and then the top of a small unpaved track, scarcely a road known as Tramp's Alley, that wandered off from the main road and eventually curled round to join Hunter Combe Lane, close to the station, close to the Stanton's house. The children used it as a shortcut sometimes. Will glanced down it now and saw that nobody had been along the path since the snow began. Down there it lay, untrodden, smooth and white, uninviting, marked only by the picture writing of birds' footprints, unexplored territory. Will found it irresistible. As he turned down into Tramp's Alley, crunching with relish through the clear, slightly crushed, crusted snow so that fragments of it clung to the fringe of his trousers, tucked into his boots, he lost sight of the sun almost at once cut off by the block of woodland that lay between the little track and the few houses edging the top of Hunter Combe Lane. As he stomped through the snow, he clutched his parcels to his chest, counting them again. The knife for Robin, the chemise leather for Hall to clean his flute, the diary for Mary, the bath salts for Gwenny, a super special felt, the super special felt tip pens for Max, all of his other presents were already bought and wrapped. Christmas was a complicated festival when you were one of nine children. The walk down the alley began quite soon to be less fun than he had expected. Will's ankles ached from the strain of kicking away through the snow. The parcels were awkward to carry. The red golden glow from the sun died away into, dull gr into a dull grayness. He was hungry and he was cold. Trees loomed on his high on his right, mostly elms with an occasional beach. At the other side of the track was a stretch of wasted of wasteland, transformed by the snow from a messy array of rack weeds and scrub into a moon landscape of white sweeping slopes and shaded hollows. Around him on the snow covered track lay twigs and small branches. Around him on the snow covered track, twigs and small branches lay scattered, brought down from the trees by the weight of the, of snow just ahead. Will saw a huge branch lying right across his path. He glanced apprehensively upward, wondering how many other dead arms of the giant of the great elms were waiting for wind or snow weight to bring them crashing down. A good time for collecting firewood, he thought, and had a sudden tantalizing image of the leaping fire that had blazed in the fireplace of the great hall, the fire that had changed the world by vanishing at the word of his command and then obediently blazing into life again. As he stumbled along in the cold snow, a sudden wild, cheerful idea sprang up in his mind out of the thought of that fire, and he paused, grinning to himself. You gonna fix it? Well, no, friend, I probably can't get you a warm Christmas day, really, but I could warm things up a bit right here, now. He looked confidently at the dead branch lying before him with the easy command now of the gift he knew was in him. He said to it softly, mischievously, "Burn!" And there, on the snow-fallen arm of the tree, and there, the snow-fallen arm of the tree burst into flame. Every inch of it, from the thick rotted base to the smallest twig, blazed with licking yellow fire. There was a hissing sound, and a tall shaft of brilliance rose from the fire like a pillar. No smoke came from the burning, and the flames were steady twigs that should have blazed and crackled briefly and then fallen into ash, burned continuously as if fed by other fuel within. Standing there alone, Will felt suddenly small and alarmed. This was no ordinary fire and not to be controlled by ordinary means. It was not behaving at all in the same way the fire in the hearth had done. He did not know what to do with it. In panic, he focused his mind on it again and told it to go out, but it burned on, steady as before. He knew that he had done something foolish, improper, dangerous perhaps. Looking up through the pillar of quivering light, he saw high in the gray sky four rooks flapping slowly in a circle. Oh, Merriman, he thought unhappily, where are you? Then he gasped as someone grabbed him from behind, blocked his kicking feet in a scuffle of snow and twisted his arms by the wrists behind his back. The parcels scattered in the snow. Will yelled with the pain in his arms. The grip on his wrist slackened at once as if his attacker were reluctant to do him any real harm, but he was still firmly held. Put out the fire, said a hoarse voice in his ear urgently. I can't, Will said honestly, 
I've tried, but I can't. The man cursed and mumbled strangely, and instantly Will knew who it was. His terror fell away like a released weight. Walker, he said, let me go. You don't have to hold me like that. The grip tightened again at once. No, you don't, boy. I know your tricks. You're the one all right, I know. Now, you're an old one, but I don't trust your kind any more than I trust the dark. You're new awake, you are, and let me tell you something you don't know. Well, you're new awake, you can't do anything to anyone unless you can see him with your eyes. So you aren't going to see me, that I know. <coughs> Will said, I don't want to do anything to you. There really are some people who can be trusted, you know. Precious few, the walker said bitterly. I could shut my eyes if you'd let me go. Pa, said the old man. Will said, you carry the second sign. Give it to me. There was a silence. He felt the man's hands fall away from his own arms, but he stood where he was and did not turn around. I have the first sign already, Walker, he said. You know I do. Look, I'm undoing my jacket and I'll pull it back, and you can see the first circle on my belt. He pulled aside his coat, still without moving his head, and was aware of the walker's hunched form slipping round at his side. The man's breath hissed out through his teeth in a long sigh and looked. As he looked, and he turned his head up to Will without caution, in the yellow light from the steadily burning branch, Will saw a face contorted with battling emotions. Hope and fear and relief wound tightly together by anguished uncertainty. When the man spoke, his voice was broken and simple as that of, as that of a small, sad child. It's so horrible, he said plaintively. And I've been carrying it for so long. I don't even remember why. Always frightened. Always having to run away. If only I could get rid of it. If only I could rest. Oh, if only it had gone. But I daren't risk giving it to the wrong one. I daren't. The things that would happen to me if I did. They're too terrible. They can't be put into words. The old ones can be cruel. Cruel! I think you're the right one, boy. I've been looking for you a long time, a long time, to give the sign to you. But how can I be really sure? How can I be sure you want a trick of the dark? He's been frightened so long, Will thought. He's forgotten how to stop, how awful, to be so absolutely lonely. He doesn't know how to trust me. It's so long since he trusted anyone, he's forgotten how. Look, he said gently, you must know I'm not part of the dark. Think. You saw the rider try to strike me down, but the old man shook his head miserably. And Will remembered how he had fled shrieking from the clearing the moment the rider had appeared. Well, if that doesn't set the help, he said, doesn't the fire tell you? The fire? Almost, the walker said. He looked at it hopefully, and then his face twisted and recalled alarm. But the fire, it'll bring them, boy. You know that. The rooks already be guarding them. And how do I know? Whether you lit the fire because you're a new awake old one playing games or as a signal to bring them after me. He moaned to himself in anguish and clutched his arms round his shoulders. He was a wretched thing, Will thought pityingly, but somehow he had to be made to understand.